Hey photographers, there's a whole lot of YouTube creators out there doing their best to explain the mystical art of taking a photograph. That's a pretty clear sign that it's a complicated subject, maybe more complicated than it should be. So rather than one more explanation that doesn't really help, maybe I can recommend a solution to this problem. For dedicated practitioners, understanding f-stops, ISO, focal lengths, and shutter speeds is kind of second nature. We understand the history and the technology that helps us grasp why a larger aperture, that's the f-stop with the smaller number, blurs the background in a portrait. But to many people, that seems confusing and complicated overly complicated. So the best solution may be to find some terminology or approach that's easier to grasp. And if I could call out one, here's a link to Tony Northrup's excellent and clever rethinking of these complex systems into a simpler, more manageable set of terms. I'm sorry that he ends up suggesting that, like the Dvorak keyboard and the metric system, on well, the US anyway, it's not going to be successful. That's too bad. It's nice that he suggested open source. It's unfortunate that he felt the need to name brand it. But either way, I would certainly support a new, simpler system. He's thought it through. It feels good to me. But he is speaking to experienced, knowledgeable, and technically adept photographers who can relate the numbers in his system to results like defocused backgrounds and perfectly frozen high jumpers. He addressed his remarks as nerdy. Well, I'd like the opportunity to take on this problem as it applies to novice photographers, the large majority who don't accept the nerdy label. I do wish I had a canoe handy. Uh, less experienced photographers often comment that they'd like to better understand their cameras so they can take full advantage of them. <laughs> My somewhat glib answer has been to tell them that using the automated features, whether that's aperture priority, auto ISO, the green scene detection mode, or face eye autofocus, is taking full advantage. The computer in your camera can look after a lot of the complexity, while you do what you do best, composition and timing. When you use manual mode, the camera is taking advantage of you. And that's what Tony's system is attempting to address. I think there must be a simpler way to master the mumbo jumbo lurking behind your camera's automated systems, particularly as some of the terms it uses, and I'm thinking specifically of ISO, don't really mean much in today's digital photography. So, what kind of terminology would make photography simpler to understand? Tony suggested that his system is results-based. In my mind, it's still all numbers that relate to settings on the camera or the lens, not the effect you get when you use the setting. And that's how I would approach this. So let's start with exposure. There are three factors that affect exposure two affect the amount of light that gets into the camera to capture the image, the amount of time the camera shutter remains open so light can enter, and the size of the opening in the lens. The third factor is ISO, which we'll deal with later. Well, the time factor shouldn't be all that complicated, but photographers like to say things like faster lenses. <laughs> Wow, does that add to the confusion for novices? Uh, let's reset that. Uh, some manufacturers already use the term time value. It's a good one. I'd keep that. And if you understand that a time value of 100 represents a shutter speed of 1 one hundredth of a second, it's easy to understand that 1,000, 1 one thousandth of a second is less time. In this case, the larger number represents a shorter duration, but it doesn't relate to the effect, which is to freeze the action. Uh, depending on your subject matter, you may want all of the scene, some of the scene, or none of the scene to look frozen. We need terminology to describe how frozen we want the image. 
So the scale should go from a fully frozen image to one where the action is blurred, but the scene is not. Sophisticated firmware algorithms can do all that. It doesn't take much AI for the camera's processor to determine whether a time value is sufficient to freeze the action in the scene. It already determines that based on two factors, the amount of movement in the scene and the amount that you're moving the camera. Both are already standard features. Many cameras incorporate stabilization and many detect if the camera is handheld or on a tripod. So with that information, the camera calculates and suggests the longest time available for a blurred water effect or the time value required to create a streak of light from a car moving through a dark scene. So that's the time value scale and it's scene dependent. The actual settings used based on factors like the lens on the camera or the amount of available light will vary, but they don't matter. It's the result we're after. Something like 5 to 10 intervals, say TV1 to TV10, should it even be simpler? Does it need a numerical setting at all? Anyway, a scale from frozen to blurred is enough. I don't need a lot of variation here, although more expensive cameras could add more. An on-screen slider makes this easy to implement. The key here is the on-screen preview so you can see how the slider is adjusting the motion blur. Time value is kind of complex. Aperture might be simpler. Here, the issue is the amount of the image that's in focus. Let's call that focus value, which represents an abstraction of the depth of focus area. Now, some manufacturers have already implemented a novice mode with a slider to set the depth of field, and I think that's a great results-based approach. Again, dependent on lens, light, and subject. Let's do that, and with a real-time preview. No confusing talks of f-stops or t-stops. It's the final image that matters. And then there's ISO, which is becoming less and less relevant with the development of digital sensors and ISO invariant sensors. Manufacturers seem unwilling to standardize, which makes me wonder what I'm really getting. It's all a trade-off in any case. I'd like to meet the photographer who said, I am not taking this interesting shot because the image will be noisy and grainy. We all want to take the image, and interest in content is more important than photo quality. So let the camera manage this to produce the best image it can with the settings I've imposed. If it's terrible, well, at least I tried. But processors can likely do better than that, to indicate that this scene will have a specific level of noise. That would be the noise value, a calculated result not a setting. If the noise value is greater than your tolerance, you can decide to turn on a light or use a flash. Now, I do like cameras that provide variable auto ISO settings, so I can decide whether quality or action is more important, but again, let the camera's computer figure that out. I want the scene captured without blur and with the highest quality possible. Third, no, that's fourth and last. There's the focal length of lenses. I appreciate the angle of view. I've advocated for that as it could provide some consistency, but really there are very few of us who look at a scene and say, I want to capture 27 degrees of this scene as that incorporates the rose window in the tower and eliminates the cars parked in front. A focal length may be marginally better, there are some whose eye is acute enough to determine they need a 35mm lens, well, on a specific camera anyway. But most of us decide our compositions visually, not numerically, so yes, we need some reference to help us choose the right lens. But when we're taking the image, not so much. We're going to turn the zoom ring, we're going to step forward or backward until we get the image we want. Expressing this numerically doesn't really help. As an in-camera setting, I'd eliminate it completely. Now, of course, you'll still need some way to help you select lenses. What's the angle of view? How much light does it pass? And Tony's right. 
t-stops expressed as an easy-to-understand numerical value would be helpful, but only to make a purchase decision. Oh boy, I miss canoeing. <laughs> well, those are my suggestions. Agreed, my version is messier and requires more in-camera computation than Tony's clean and numerical approach, but it concentrates your thinking on the image and the results. It lets the cameras worry about numbers and details. That's what cameras will do more and more in the next decade. I look at a scene and think, I want the scene to be frozen with blurred pedestrians and traffic. Or I want Kim in focus with a soft, blurry background. Not this needs D13 A5 V87 with L121. Uh, can my cohort of aging practitioners live without the old terms? Well, I believe we can, but there's no reason to suspect that all three systems, the old terms, Tony's, and a novice-friendly, results-oriented system couldn't coexist. It's all just firmware. Switch between them as needed. Clearly, this is a discussion starter. I will read and reply to all your relevant comments. And this video was recorded in May 2020. These are challenging times. Stay safe. And finally, here's an invitation to subscribe and my thanks. Your views, comments, likes, dislikes, and subscriptions are all appreciated. Music